right. Well, uh, what's up? What's up? Welcome to another episode of All Over Voice Over Kiff VH. I'm your host, Kiff VH, and I am so excited to uh, to welcome to the show a uh, new friend, voice actor, um, the host of the Voice Over Pros Club on Clubhouse, uh, the lovely, the talented Danny Burnside. Dude, thanks so much for, for joining me today and being on the show and, and, and for simulcasting this live on Clubhouse. This is very exciting. Yeah, it's a fun experiment. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Kip. You it's bet. a blessing to be here. And, uh, you know, your reputation precedes you. You're the man. So uh, it, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much again, my friend. You bet. Thank you. Well, I, I had Rama Valuri on the show recently, and he uh, put us in touch. And and uh, so it's it's great to get to know you better. How did you, what's your what's your story? Where are you from originally? Well, first of all, I met Rama in prison. So I just want to throw a gift, <laughs> big thanks to him for helping me through this transition. Now, actually, uh, Rama and I used to be repped by the same agency. So we spent a lot of time in the waiting rooms together. Ah, so yes. that's really how you get to know people very well. Amen. Amen. But uh, Rama's a great guy. And I was thrilled to listen to your episode with him. You, oh, you both are terrific voices. So it's oh, just killer you. to hear you guys. And both terrific improv artists. Oh, that's man. Really He's amazing. It was so great to be able to spend some time with that dude. But I, I gave him three hours, so we we, wow. we can we can let Rama go at this point. He's had plenty of <laughs> opportunity to share his story. Hilarious. <laughs> What's where are you? Are you where are you from originally? Are you from out here? Are you from back east? Where 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 did you? Uh, how'd you get started and all that stuff? So I'm from San Diego originally, oh. and uh, I actually went to high school in San Luis Obispo, so the central coast of California. So kind of born and raised out here. Uh -huh. And I was involved in choirs way before I was ever a thespian. So really? I used to do mixed choirs and vocal jazz choirs. I guess mu you could say music was my first love, but I was a vocalist. I didn't play any instruments until I started playing piano when I was 16. I actually picked it up in order to play choral warm-ups. Really? Just kind of going up and down the scales. Uh, I, at that point, I was kind of like a student director for our choir. I was yeah. taking it super seriously. Like, I thought I was going to go into choral music. Yeah. Either try to be a professional uh, choral vocalist or a professional choral director. So I figured, well, I'm about, at that point, I was 16, which is about 11 years behind everyone else who has been taking private piano lessons since they were five. Right. You know? Right. I mean, I, I was just kind of blessed that I fell into an excellent choir program in San Luis Obispo. We only moved up there because my parents split up. Oh. I just fell into it. I mean, wow. I was never encouraged to pursue music prior to that. I was not in the fortunate position to have private instruction as a vocalist or an instrumentalist. Yeah. And I just happened to fall into literally one of the top choir programs in the state. As wow. a matter of fact, my senior year, we won number one in the state competition. So I just kind of got lucky, you know? That's amazing. Um, I was an athlete. That That's one thing that was, was terrific about my childhood is I was always involved in sports. And even to this day, I really value having that athletic upbringing. Yeah. It's just kind of good mentally to have a foot out of the arts as well. Like I'm yeah. a performing artist and I'm also, I'm not currently an athlete, but I still love sports and listen to a lot of sports talk radio. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what happened was uh, my high school switched from a semester system to a trimester system. So super random, yeah. but it was, it posed a really difficult um, situation for us where you can only choose one elective at that point. So prior to that, I was playing sports and I was in choir. Okay. And then once it switched to trimesters, it made it where you can only choose one, which is really a bummer for anyone who oh, did multiple man. disciplines. That yeah, sucks. it was terrible. It was really, really bad for the student body. Yeah. They actually, there was like a protest that the students held, but they didn't care. I'm sure it was uh, for budget, budget right. reasons. I'm sure. Right. right. Totally. So I kind of had to make the tough decision and I literally kind of put sports on the back burner. I mean, the truth is I was a decent athlete, but there's no way I was going to go up. I probably wouldn't even have played college sports. Right. I mean, yeah. that's just the reality of it. There's yeah. no way I was on the course to be a professional athlete as much as I loved it. Sure. And at that point I was doing very well in choir and I'd started uh, doing some plays as well. Awesome. So the first play I ever did was uh, some Shakespeare. It's so random, but I fell into a Shakespeare club. The first two plays I ever did were Shakespeare comedies. It's like, wow, that's a start for you. you know? <laughs> exactly. Oh my God. I wish I could get the footage now. I'm sure it's the iambic oh. pentameter is just painful, but yeah, it was, it was a blast in and we thought we were, we were big shots. <laughs> right. Right. Totally. So uh, yeah, I was hitting choir super hard at that point. I kind of put sports on the back burner uh -huh. and just, uh, just hit it nonstop. And like I mentioned my senior year, we won the state competition we were then invited to tour Europe, uh, so at least Germany and Austria, because oh, we had won that state competition. It was, it was amazing. Incredible. Really. Yeah. So I uh, got to go to Salzburg, Austria, which is the birthplace of Mozart, and sing in a couple of cathedrals in Munich and in Salzburg. Just an amazing, amazing experience. Yeah. And so for whatever reason, I then decided that I was going to pursue musical theater. It kind of combined my two loves, which yeah. was theater and music at that point. 
So I actually went to the University of Miami Hurricanes, the, uh-huh. the U, right? And <laughs> right. Uh, started studying musical theater there in their conservatory. And then about a year in, I just was coming back for a Christmas uh, vacation, right? And uh, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, which is in Los Angeles, were holding auditions. Yeah. I don't even know why I decided to audition. I'm sure it had to do with financial reasons because I was on a scholarship at the U, but it wasn't a full scholarship. And it's yeah. a private, private school. It's pretty dang expensive. Oh, wow. And the, the education was great, but man, you, you start thinking about, wow, this times four, this is going to get crazy. That's right. right. Absolutely. So I just, I, I was doing a layover in LA before jumping on a little commuter to San Luis Obispo. <laughs> and I decided to go audition for the Academy in Hollywood on the layover. And you oh know, Kiffa, sometimes you just rock an audition. Like yes. We do that even now. Sometimes you're just in the pocket and sometimes you're not, even yep. now and then. I walked out of that audition knowing I just destroyed it. And I was also (laughs) fresh out of a year in a musical theater conservatory. So my skills were pretty sharp, perhaps relative to those just coming out of high school. Certainly. And I ended up getting a full ride. They wrote me a letter a couple, like two weeks later, because the semester started like the second week of January. This was like December 22nd or something. Oh my God. Like, hey, if you want to join for the spring semester, it's going to be a full ride with the exception of... uh, there's no student housing. So you'd have to pay for your own apartment in Hollywood. Other than that, your education is free. I just said, there was no decision. I mean, because I didn't have a lot of financial backing. It was like, all right, I guess I'm moving to LA. Wow. (laughs) That was 2003. Uh And I've been here ever since. Amazing. Oh, that's amazing, dude. What, uh, what, what's I, that, that school was on my short list of where I wanted to go. And I, I, I honestly didn't have a choice of where I was going to go to college growing up where I grew up and, and that kind of stuff. But, but American Academy of Dramatic Arts was like above UCLA, above like, you had, wow. like all those things. Like I just, I, I didn't know what I needed to know. And it was the one place that I saw ads for and there was no internet when I was coming up. So it was just like, well, this sounds amazing. Uh, what, what did you get from that school? I haven't talked to too many people who've gone through it and, uh, and, and learned a lot. Like what, what skills did it nurture in you and introduce you to? Well, the one thing I'll preface is no matter what pedigree of school you go to in the performing arts, 10 years later, 90% of your classmates don't even live in the city anymore. They've all moved home. Yes. They're not even doing it anymore. That's right. It doesn't matter if you go to Juilliard, it doesn't matter what school you go to. Yes. 10 years later, It'll be you and a handful of your classmates that are still on the grind, period. (laughs) And so they told us that then, and boy, is that the reality. Yeah. It's a tough gig, and it's not for the meek. And it's only, you know, I think think on the very first day, they must have told us a number of times, if you could be doing anything else with your life and be happy, go do that. Yeah. Go do that. You know, don't even waste the time here. Yeah. And yeah. so if you if you can't internalize that and know that this is really, really what's in your heart to do, you may as well just go do something else that'll be more stable, more secure right. and bring you more just stability in general. Right. But I, I knew I was all in. I mean, I knew that since I was 16. I knew I was all in. Yeah. It wasn't really a big question for me. Yeah. It's a pretty focused curriculum. There's not a lot of general ed, which I kind of appreciate it, actually. Yeah. And it's funny enough, even at the University of Miami, we kind of had the reverse pyramid going on in the musical theater program. We weren't taking a lot of general ed our freshman year. Most of it was specialized classes. Wow. Which like, most freshmen do take general ed, right? Yeah, totally. You don't get I'm into kinda, it until I'm kinda, your junior yeah. year. I don't even know why they did that, but they did. Wow. And uh, it kind of benefited me. Yeah. So I guess what I loved about the Academy, it it really was a continuation of Miami, but it wasn't just acting. Like we were taking dance, we were taking dialects. You know, it's funny, Kiff, I never even considered being a voice artist, but we were taking vocal production, diaphragmatic breathing, Alexander technique, musical theater, all all, uh, even dialects, all crafts, uh, techniques that assist a voice actor. But I never even thought about voice acting. I I didn't think about voice acting until I was like 28. Oh, we're talking like years after graduation. Right. And it's just funny. I guess I was just going to be an actor at that point or a musical theater actor at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just, I, what I loved the most about the Academy is that everyone, all the instructors there were all in. They, they weren't there for a paycheck because they're not getting rich and instructing there. Right. You know, it's just, they're not, they're not tenured Yale professors. Right. They're right. folks who have worked contracts in the performing arts and they're, they're all in now. Yeah. And not to, not to put down any, arts education. But I think an important question to ask yourself, whatever school you're going to is, when was the last time X instructor worked a professional contract? If ever. 100%. If ever. 100%. I know that's a tough thing to say to somebody because it's not like you can't learn anything from those individuals. Sure. 
but it's very different to like study acting from a textbook or like studying theater, right? Right. Rather than studying from someone who's worked a contract in 2021. Yes. I completely agree with you. There's, there's just, there's a level of, of, uh, I mean, all in is the right, is the right idea. Like, like you, you, you want people who are committed and hungry. And it also speaks to like, you know, like I'm not getting rich teaching this class. I do this because I love this work and because I need to, I need to share it. Like I was talking to my wife last night about, um, the idea of teaching is not mind to mind, but heart to heart. I love and that. Like that concept of I'm sharing my passion with your passion. And if it connects and it ignites, then I've done my job. But if it doesn't, then, you know, this, this is like, I, I got this in, in college and I'm grateful for the education that I got, but I definitely felt like when I entered the workspace that I had so much more I had to learn in, on the boots on the ground version. And it's not like people who go to Juilliard or go to, you know, uh, a, a specialized school working with people who are doing it don't have their own learning curve as well, but there's a reality that they're aware of that leads you down this path in a, in a different way. And hugely, and, if there's one piece of advice, I wish I had, maybe they mentioned it to me, obviously it, it went in one ear and out the other. Yeah. You know, when you graduate, you're not ready for anything. It's not like, Oh, I got the degree here. I am guys. Right. <laughs> you know, right. I, I wish I had immediately gotten into another class immediately. Mm. And I probably, I, I had just been going so ham since like 16 at that point that when I graduated <laughs> from the Academy, I just kind of needed a breather. Yeah. And not that I wasn't involved in the arts. I, I auditioned for plays and, and music, mainly plays and musicals is what I started to audition for. Sure. But I did sure. not enroll into another class until probably, probably two or two and a half years after I graduated. Uh -huh. And you just kind of have that feeling like, okay, I, I graduated, but I, I really wish I had immediately gotten to, into another professional class at that point. Yes. Yes. The difference between, uh, I mean, my wife says all the time, you never stop learning. You should never stop learning. And if you're not, I mean, I'm taking a full load of classes right now at UCLA extension and, uh, you know, it's, it's so like, not only is it invigorating and I'm learning more, but it's keeping me sharp. It's keeping me active and it's keeping me hungry. And it's, Love you know what I mean? It's real easy when you get to a place like ourselves where it's like, oh, I'm a working professional actor in Los Angeles. I have been for years. Uh, and I can sit back and rest of my laurels or I can, or I can keep grind. What's next. What's next. What's next. Keep staying hungry and staying, um, staying uh, excited about like different aspects of the work that you haven't done or things that you want to do again, people that you want to work with projects that you want to develop, all that kind of stuff. It's like, it's just this, uh, it's, it's, um, uh, the image in my head is like a, a nesting doll. You know what I mean? Like the, this, this career can be like, you just keep lay, peeling layers. I don't care for onions. My wife's allergic to them. So the nesting doll is a better metaphor, but basically, uh, you know what I mean? It just, it just keeps giving and giving and giving and giving. And the deeper you go, the closer to who you really are, um, it, you sort of tap into, you know? And it's a constantly exciting career because you yeah. never know what's around the next corner, man, just constant evolution and excitement, but you get what you put in. That's it's like the love you take is equal to love you make or scratch that reverse it. Right. Yes. You follow me. <laughs> totally. It's exactly right. So you, uh, so you, you, you knock around LA, you're a recent graduate of the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. You do some stuff and uh, what, what leads you into, into voice acting? When do you make that discovery? It, did it like, for me, it came to me with, I was with an agent that just handled everything. And then you would be like, oh, well now we're going to do some VO and we're going to do some on camera and we're going to do whatever. There wasn't the specializing that there is in a market like Los Angeles, like New York, like Chicago. Uh, was, was that how it came to you or how did, how did voice actor, uh, voice actory, uh, I, I've just created a, a new, uh, it's voice actory is that there's a category. Uh, what, how, how did it come to you? I really kind of fell into it, but it was only through the preparation meeting opportunity. So oh. I was just grinding it out on the audition circuit for live theater and live musical theater, both uh -huh. some musical theater stuff, some regional stuff and was involved in that, yeah. which is so gratifying, but not for your pocketbook. No. Three months of, of uh, unpaid or very low paid rehearsals yeah. and then minimal pay for actual gigs. I mean, when I realized how little even brought, obviously if, if you're on the, if you're on the marquee, it's something else. But I, right. when I realized how little 
chorus members made even on broadway i was like are you kidding me man i was like really i guess that's why everyone comes to la right, <laughs> right. I mean, it's a tough lesson to learn but um yeah. again if you're on the marquee if you're a name player then it's a different story right so um i did a lot of theater in la small theaters you know book some stuff at Cell adler and some other theaters around town awesome and then i had was auditioning through so i was non-union at this time i was auditioning through uh, actors access for a spot and it was for a uh, mockumentary dating show and I just was auditioning for one of like the quote unquote actors on the show. So you're, you're, you're playing the role of a contestant on the show. Gotcha. So it, it'll be presented as if you're a real person, but actually it's an actor. So sorry to break to everyone, but there is no such thing as reality TV, right? I mean, there is no such thing. <laughs> nope. It's, it's all not. actors it's all trying to get, advance their careers. <laughs> exactly. And, right. um, you know, directors telling them what drama to make up. So anyway, yes. I went to this audition again, this was non-union. It's probably like a hundred bucks. If even that copy yeah. and credit, one of these gigs. Yeah. And uh, I auditioned for one of these characters and at the callback, I got lucky. I got a callback and they said, you know what? Would you mind reading these sides for us? And they handed me the host sides for the host of the show. I was like, okay. And I booked it. I booked it as the host. Amazing. So I was like, oh, all right. I guess I should think about doing hosting a little bit, but it kind of just fits my personality in general. I guess I kind of always have been that host personality. Uh -huh. And this was just an opportunity that presented itself that I, you know, I took advantage of and, I kind of rock the audition, I guess. Amazing. I think being a host is kind of like being the president. They should give it to the person who doesn't want to do it, right? Like that's who should be the president. <laughs> Not right. the guy who wants to be the president. Exactly. Sometimes, right. you know, a great host is someone who's just good with people, not necessarily someone who envisions themselves as some amazing host. Yes. It's all about relating to your audience. Exactly. So I guess I wasn't trying too hard at that point. That's why I booked it. So I just decided at that point I was going to hit hosting a lot harder because I did have some success doing it. And I felt like the shoot went really well, kind of naturally for me. Yeah. So I started studying with Marky Costello. She's a, she does a lot of hosting classes in LA on the West side. She's a big name. And also with Maureen Browns. So these are two like big names. If you're interested in getting involved in hosting. Awesome. Studied with them for a while, uh, did that pretty hard and uh, was having some decent success as a host. Um, I toured with a motorcycle show as the host and live announcer for three seasons, kind of like a national tour around the United States, yeah. which was a blast, but living out of a suitcase. It sucks. But, uh, a per sucks. diem. <laughs> that was the first time I ever had a per diem in my life. I was like, wow, <laughs> this is the life right here. That's right. But we're talking 12 hour days sometimes. So it's yeah. exhausting. Yes, I mean, that, yeah. that's when I really learned about vocal health. Because, mm. you know, when you're done, you just want to go to the hotel bar and, and shoot it, but you just got to take it easy. You have a 7.30 call the next morning to do it, all, do it all over again. Right. And because I was also the live announcer for the tour, I was in there before everyone else doing like the 30-minute call for the vendors and the stunt show. Yeah. And then opening the doors at 8 a.m. And then every half hour an announcement and including in, as in addition to doing a live live stage. Yeah. It was just incredibly vocally exhausting. It's kind of like doing eight shows a week on Broadway, like that, yeah. that vibe. 100%. So I came back from three seasons of that and I was a little bit burnt out of just the touring life. Yeah. And so I decided to just audition for film and TV hosting in LA and I booked up a, a sizzle reel pilot. So a, 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 a shoot that we were going to shoot the entire pilot for, but it's just going to be a weekend shoot again for another dating show. This is like hosting. So a lot of these opportunities are dating shows, right? Okay, yeah. So I booked it and I was a co-host with a young lady who was fantastic and we did the whole shoot. And then at the end of the weekend shoot, they approached me and said, Hey, you know, we've got another, the, the producers approached me and said, we've got another project that we're working on and we think you have a great voice for it. Would you be interested in laying down the VO uh, pro bono? So meaning I wouldn't get, I wouldn't be paid for it, yeah. but I'd get copy and credit for it. Yeah. And it's just this funny thing. Even at this point, Kiff, I was like maybe 28 or so. Yeah. And I had just never even thought about doing voiceover. And all of a sudden the gig was being handed to me. Like not even, not even like, would well, you want to audition for this? Like, Hey, do you right. want this gig? It's like, yes, I do. <laughs> but again, this is after 15 years in the performing arts and yes. never letting a year go by that I wasn't grinding. Never. Right. And I was always increasing some skill, the stage acting, screen acting, hosting. I mean, whatever it was, I was always grinding on something, yes. you know, sketch. I was doing sketch comedy in my early twenties and that type of thing. Yeah. So uh, we recorded the VO and we just kind of knocked it out of the park. Uh, it's really funny. It was a, for a show called Bitches of South Beach about dogs, like bitches. <laughs> dogs of millionaire owners in South Beach, Miami, that are getting pushed around in diamond studded strollers. Oh bitches God. of South Beach. Just hilarious. <laughs> uh, you know, obviously, I think my vocal print just kind of matched it. It's just, I don't know, something about it just right, worked. Right, right. So um, I was really, really fortunate. And based on that, that, I thought I was just getting copy and credit, but I was like, oh, cool. I'm going to start looking into voiceover. I had also been told on a number of VO auditions, like after I do the read, they'd be like, oh, you must do VO. 
And, you know, that's kind of generic, like, oh, people tell me I should do VO. But I was getting that note from casting directors in the world of hosting. Like, oh, yeah. half, half the auditions I went on, yeah. they'd be like, oh, you must do VO. So I was like, all right, I guess I should, you know, I'm getting nudged this direction. Right. I was incredibly blessed after being blessed for the gig. I was blessed again that, um, that those same producers sh- shot me an email two weeks later. And they said, hey, one of the agencies that we are pitching this show to is interested in meeting with you. What? And so would you like us to set up an artist introduction? You just can't ask for a better setup. Are you but again, it's after grinding. I was of like course. 28 or 29 at this point. I, yeah. wasn't, I wasn't like two weeks out of school. Right. You know, I was just grinding. Yeah. You know, doing doing uh, LA casting and LA, and Actors Access and, you know, doing non-union work before I became new union, just seriously grinding, doing yeah. all that. Yeah. So uh, I met with the agency and they picked me up and uh, they said, you know, we love you, but we also want you to take some classes at Cominson and Cominson because you've never done VO before. Yeah. Like the agent couldn't believe it. He's like, so tell me about your VO work other than <laughs> Bitches of South Beach. I was like, well, hate to break it to you. I thought, I was like, should I just see myself out? <laughs> and uh, he said, look, we love you. We're going to bring you on. But why don't you go ahead and take some classes too? Because, you know, we want us, we want to submit you across the board and you probably have no idea what you're doing really. Mm. So uh, I started studying at Calmanson and Calmanson. Great. There I met Lenan Zagger, who was my first VO mentor. Took Amazing. a couple classes there, took a promo class that she was teaching. She saw that I was just hungry as hell. And I truly yeah. mean that because I was. <laughs> just like you and I can notice when a, a student has that hunger. Totally. It's very easy to identify Completely. compared to someone who just wants to make, make a quick buck because someone told them they had a good voice or something. Yeah. You know? So uh, Lenan invited me into a private workout group that she was the host of, or at least the moderator of. And I showed up the first day and it was me and a bunch of LA reps working voice actors. Wow. And I was so intimidated and so scared, but I did it every week for an entire year. It was the best so thing I ever could have fallen into. So, great. so huge thanks to Lenan. She's been my, a mentor of mine since. And uh, she was just someone that was gracious and uh, generous to me. Amazing. Oh, that's so great. That, you know, and you've said it a couple of times and I really appreciate having that sentiment echoed. Like, you know, I've found that, that the amount of seasoning that you get as a, as a performer doesn't begin with the first time you step into it in front of a microphone. It is that 10, 15 years of hard work grinding, whether that's a combination of in school or in your closet or in the car Uh, You know, for me, it was literally driving from Cleveland to Detroit six hours a week, three times a week to audition for stuff and just running my mouth in the car, doing impressions of billboards to entertain myself because I loved playing with and seeing what this instrument could do. And there wasn't opportunities for voice matching, you know, no one, not until I got to this market, but in that process of play, it's like, it's like, have you done this before? Yes, not for money, but I've been doing it since I was six, man. Like I'm, I've been made, I've, I've been, you know, it's like, you don't want to use sword if you're going into battle, right? Like, uh, it's not battle tested yet, but it's strong metal, man. Uh, and it, it is that, that seasoning that you spend. And, and I think that's something that a lot of folks who are, who are new to VO or have got a great instrument, but don't know how to use it quite yet. Um, do need to give themselves the the gift of time, uh, the gift of exp- exploration, right? Like just just screwing around and, and learning what you can do. Um, I, I think that's a really valuable uh, discovery. Um, and the secret is we'd still do it not for money. Absolutely, absolutely. It's too much fun. I love it. The fact that they're gonna pay. Like I I do tons of like, you know. Uh, what is spec stuff for like trailers? Like I do a, a ton of stuff. That's just like, well, it's not paid now, but yeah. But if I'm the guy you use for Tom Hanks in two sessions, I will be paid and I'll, and I'll be paid for another 25. So it's worth that stretch. You know, I mean, it it is such a, such a, a constantly shifting place and about, you know, you start to learn other aspects of the business of getting to know casting directors, getting to know, the producers who like you, you might do an audition. You have no idea where that audition's going, but trusting that, that, that person who's receiving that audition is becoming a fan of the work that you're doing, you know, and, and that just because you can't see that sweat equity in front of you doesn't mean that you're not paying it. And, um, you know, I think that's something that, uh, well, it's, you know, 
that we're echoing in there. So, so you, so you get, you get, you, you get a, a mentor and the workout. Tell me about the workout group. Like, like, uh, what, what was it that was so impactful to you? Why do you, do you recommend folks get into one? You know, how do you find a good workout group of like, you know, like that, you know, I, I was, I'm in the same boat. I got, fortunately, I got invited by a friend into an improv VO group and made like 12 friends that we still stay connected to. Like, what was your experience with that? Well, you just said it, those friends, this was a decade ago. And those friends that I met in that group are still my tightest VO confidants yeah. still 10 years later. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the huge benefit of a workout group is that you don't even realize it, but you're making those connections. That's right. And 10 years later, a handful of those folks are still on the grind. And those are, those are folks you can lean on for referrals, not only to agencies, but also casting. Yeah. And that's really the foot in the door in this industry is a referral. Yes. And uh, there you go. You've got it built in just because you've been, all been, had your foot on the acceleration the entire time. That's right. Funny enough, it was a promo workout group. Really? I was a fresh VO talent. It's super random. How it, just because Lenan was gracious enough to invite me in. Yeah. Um, I was, I was a fresh VO talent had just signed with my first VO agency. And all of a sudden I was in a pro promo group, but obviously I was the newbie in the group and they all knew that, but they saw my hunger. Yes. They, they saw my, my, my motivation. Yeah. So yeah. I would do some commercial uh, spots as well. Yeah. And just because yeah. mainly what I was reading for at the time was commercial, yeah. but I also yeah. got a, a great, great grasp for, for promo. Awesome. I think what I gained the most out of that was just the professionalism of every, everyone else involved. Hmm. Just seeing how they handle themselves. You really learn from watching pros work, not just from watching anybody work, but from watching pros almost so by true. osmosis, you pick things up. So true. how they, how they approach the mic, the moment that they allow themselves before beginning. Some of us who are high energy individuals, we just get in front of the mic and just start going. We say, you know, you can, you can take your time. This is your time. Right. Whether it's an audition, you could go to a live casting and you can take, you can take that moment before yeah. it's your time. Yeah. And sometimes it's nice to actually demand that in a non-aggressive way, but I'm going to take this moment before I begin. Yeah. It's just a, an idea of professionalism. We were lucky enough that we would have a studio engineer with us um, wherever we were. I think it was Anarchy Post in Burbank. Awesome. And just watching the relationship between the talent and the engineer, observing that relationship and the give and take. Yeah. This was all new to me. So I was just uh, absorbing, just like a sponge, just picking it up here and there. Yeah. How folks um, how folks read copy. A big thing that I learned was the ABCs. Like the first take comes really naturally to me. But now I was learning about how to give a B and a C read, which was a little more of a foreign concept to me. It's like, okay, gotcha. Here's how you modify it just by shades. Yeah, a little yeah, bit of a yeah. different different shade. Do you have a do you have a sequence that you use for your ABC or do you or do you just kind of go with the flow or feel like I'm going to contrast what I just did or what's what's your how do you approach uh, an ABC read? Only because I'm naturally a high energy individual with Same. a pretty expressive vocal pattern. Yeah. I'll kind of go against that pattern against that for my subsequent reads. Yeah. So I'll slow down a bit because I'm a quick talker, even if I'm not trying to be. Yes. Sometimes that's perfect for the copy. Sometimes it's not perfect for the copy. I just want to show them that I have the ability to take my time on a read. Yes. So oftentimes for my B read, I'll kind of just, if I'm in fourth gear right now, I'll take it down to second gear. Yeah. And I'll also bring it in even to a closer proximity. Yeah. You know, even if it's a nice conversational tone for the first one, I'll make it even more intimate for the second one. Yeah. So not necessarily romantic or quiet, but just intimate and in a, a, a slower pace, a slower delivery, more of a thought provoking delivery, perhaps. Yeah. And then on the third one, if they're even still with you for the third one, they love you. I mean, <laughs> I mean even, right. if they, even if they love you, they're not listening to the third one, right? I mean, That's maybe right. they will, maybe they won't. That's if you're right. on the cutting room floor, maybe they'll listen to the third one. Right. So then, I'll, then I'll, I will throw in a lot of improv because I do have an improv background. Yes. Yeah, so I'll really open it up for the third one and add some improv that serves the script. Yes. I think, you know, it's got the number one rule of improv is it has to, well, I guess maybe not the number one, but one B, it has <laughs> to serve the script. It can't yeah. just be, oh, look, I can improv. Right. It, it, it's just someone calling attention to themselves at that point. Right. If you can make your improv serve the script once again, and if you can tie it into actually the action that's happening, it's like, wow, this person, this person gets it. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I'll, I'll add, um, uh, one joke, shorter, shorter, shorter. If you can make that joke, if you can make that that joke that you're adding or that moment brief, uh, short enough that they could fit it into a 30, 
like without having to like uh, adjust for the tag where you're just like going off. Like, I mean, I've been in enough group reads where it's like, oh, they want improv. And then you improvise a whole nother 60 second spot of, of, you know, nonsense at the end of it with a couple hilarious standups that it's still like, this is, no one's ever going to hear this or <laughs> why would you, you know, but like, but like, I love that notion of, of how short, how quick can you get a good laugh and out? And and um, I, I think improv is critical for your audition, especially especially when you've got the room in in a, in, in a three. And I I agree with you too. Like half the time, I find myself doing two more, more now than than three, just because it's like I could I could contrast what I did, but it wouldn't be my A take if I wasn't proud of it. And if I'm going to show you range, here's my B, and a, a C now is just flexing. Um, so, so I'm, I'm all flex. Uh, you know what I mean? I've been doing, um, I study, uh, ape movement with Terry notary, which has been uh quadrupeding, which is fascinating, been, dude. It's extraordinary. And, and Terry's hands down the best acting teacher I've ever worked with. He's Cirque du Soleil. He's, um, uh, but he's also a former gymnast. And he's a motion capture performer. He did. He was. He was the dog in Call of the Wild. He played Baby Groot. He played Rocket in the Planet of the Apes films. But uh, one of the things that he talked about energetically that really resonated with me was front body, mid body, back body, and doing a series of three. In my front body is how I meet you, how we greet. I'm like my 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 um, my extrovert is the front half of my body. My back body is back here. I'm just moving from the back of my it's my it's where Harrison Ford lives it's where Sam Elliott lives but also it's where I live and it's thoughtful and relaxed and the mid body is is comfortable and open and here and present uh, but not as laid back but engaged and that it has become like my new rule of 3 that's been really helpful to find that to play with that shift and it's physical and tactile you know what i mean it's kind of like so what I like about voice matching is I can, there's measurables to that. You either sound like John Travolta or you don't, you know what I mean? And uh, so like, there's something uh, specific about that. It's not a moving sort of esoteric target you're trying to hit. Um, anyway. Uh, I'm absolutely going to use that. That's right? brilliant. Isn't that cool? Absolutely. And you can straight up feel it and it's, and, and it, because it's physical, I can dial in, in the studio. I can dial it. I can repeat it. You know, it's not like, oh, I got to I got to live off of what I sent the original audition in and trying to remember what I was doing. Um, all that kind of stuff. Awesome. So uh, so tell me about like your journey into VO. So now you're repped and you're taking classes and you've got the worker groups. What what's how did things start happening for you in in VO in terms of booking and stuff like that? Like what what space do you what waters do you swim in? Um you know, what do you learn on the job? Literally my first day recording. So this was at the, at the point in time when we were, would record auditions on site at the agency. Obviously that's all turned upside down nowadays. Sure. But at this point we were going into the booth of the agency and recording with a booth director. Yes. So I booked a very, very small commercial gig. They gave me three scripts that day and I booked one of them. Amazing. The agent was like, this hasn't happened in a really long time. And again, I was like, should I see myself out? He's like, no, you booked one. And then I didn't book one again for a very long time. I mean, that's a tough education right there. That it's is, like, oh, man. so it's I'm not like this. Yeah. <laughs> right. No. All right. <laughs> like I was ready to, you know, go put down a down payment in Bel Air at that point. Yeah, and right. I was like, oh, maybe Tijuana instead. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I booked that one and it wasn't anything big, but it was just like a, a, a taste. So it was like a little sample. I was like, oh, wow, cool. Yeah. And then it, it was a grind. And you hear the top players talking about a hundred to one ratio of auditioning for a hundred spots and, and maybe booking one. Yeah. And these are for some of the top players. And I definitely was not that at this point. Yeah. I had to learn the hard way, but I was, I was down but I had to learn the hard way that these bookings are few and far between yes. no matter what. Yes. And so I started just grinding hard, but I then decided, all right, I'm going to start putting together my home studio. I started to uh, just absorb more of the, of the industry that was available to me watching voiceover body shop and watching, uh, you know, Chuck and Stacy show and view buzz weekly and just kind of just starting to absorb yeah. um, everything I could Rob Paulson's podcast, just yeah. kind of just, so that I could be doing dishes in the morning and thinking voiceover. Yes. I, I found myself in that 
position where I was kind of waiting around for agency auditions. Mm. It'd be two or three in the afternoon and I didn't get one yet. And I haven't done anything all day. Yeah. Just playing call of duty or Madden or whatever. Right. Yeah, totally. And that's a blast. It's super fun to do that, but you don't get anywhere doing that. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, you can, you can be 16 and 0 in your Madden season and win the super bowl. And then actually when you turn <laughs> off the PlayStation, you're like, all right. So I decided I needed to start getting started earlier than two or three in the afternoon, waiting around for an audition. Yes. And one simple way to do that was plugging into the VO podcasts that are out there, the YouTube shows. I started doing that. I started being more active taking other classes uh -huh. because uh, that, that initial workout group lasted about a year or so. And then it, it kind of fizzled out as many of them do. Yep. And I did not instantly enroll into another one. So it, it took a while before my next booking after that first one, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it was, it was a little bit later and I was like, wow. Yeah. And when I booked that next one, you better believe I had a different frame of mind mm. and I was so grateful for it. And I, I understood the amount of grind that it seriously takes in this industry. Yeah. You got to be, you got to be totally committed to that yeah. ongoing. Absolutely. So yeah, I kept, kept going hard. I always uh, felt like I did well in commercial and I, I kind of naturally have a promo voice anyway. That's why those producers gave me that promo gig in the first place. Yeah. So promo comes pretty naturally to me. So I was always reading for a ton of commercial and a ton of promo and I was not reading for much animation. Yeah. It was a little bit of a, a hurdle that I had to cross with the agency. Sometimes it's easy to get pigeonholed with an agency you're a this guy or you're a this gal. Yeah. You read for this or that. Yeah. And it's difficult to cross those hurdles sometimes. Like, hey, I want to be considered for some animation. Well, can we hear some animation that you've done? It's like, well, I haven't done any animation. That's why I want to start <laughs> reading for animation. Right. It's a total catch-22, right? Right. So I started to plug into the animated world a little bit more and understanding what you could do vocally, like you were saying, you know, what you can do with your instrument. I had always been a vocalist, but I'd never really been an impressionist. Mm -hmm. I always just kind of leaned on my money voice. Yeah. So I started to experiment a little more and then uh, just showing them that I was dedicated to that education, yeah. enrolling in classes, shooting them an email like, hey, I'm studying with blank and blank on Friday. Looking forward to it. I'll let you know how it goes. Yeah. It just yeah. shows them like, look, I'm putting in, I'm putting it on my end. Right. And I, I hope that you can meet me somewhere halfway. Right. So yeah, that, yeah, and luckily then they started sending me out for video games and animation. Awesome. And I, I got another taste pretty quickly off the bat, not in animation, but in video games. I was like, okay, this is something I can do. Yeah. But still now the career aspiration for me, I think I just enjoy promo more than anything. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy the paychecks of commercial. There's no doubt about that. Without a doubt. I mean, it's funny. Like it's the same thing that I mentioned about live theater. It's like when you realize what you make commercially relative to what you make doing a video game role, you're like, really? I thought those people were making bank doing video games and some are, some, some are. are, some are, but, but the money's in commercial. I think my heart is more in promo than anything else. Yeah. What is it about promo that, that resonates with you so much? And, and, um, uh, well, well off of that, like wh your heart's in promo. Why talk, talk to me about that a little bit. I think promo is kind of like hosting in a way. Huh? Promo, yeah. promo is inviting folks to something and it doesn't That's have so to be great. in a presentational manner. Right. But it's inviting your friends to something. Yeah. That's what I mean. I guess commercial can be that too. It's inviting them to to partake in a product. The promo is a lot like that. It's like, dude, Kip, you gotta check this show out. Like that's yeah. like inviting a buddy of mine to see something that I'm genuinely interested in. Yeah. I think I've just always been a natural host. Um, even in school, I was always like the student representative and I had no aspirations of going into politics. <laughs> Again, I didn't even want to do it but I'd get voted in to do it. Right. Like, all right, I guess I'm, I guess I am it in all its glory. Right. I guess I'm the student right. rep. Right. So there you go. <laughs> I think promo just fits my personality more than anything else. And maybe that's, maybe that's a combination of, yes, I do love it, but B, maybe it comes easier to me and that's why I love it. Huh? Interesting. That's so true. Like that. And, and I, I've just recently started doing more promo to have that I had, you know, looking at my, my bingo card of VO work. And that was one of the things that was like a Yahtzee that was really tough to get your, get your mitts on. And it is so satisfying and fun because it's that, that energy and the, there's something about doing promo that feels like old time voiceover. You've got to, you have, you have a, um, you know, how many frames is this? We got to get this in, in 20 frames, you know, that like the precision of that and the energy of it. Um, and, and also like the, the cutting edge of, of what's coming out that people don't know is coming, but you know, is really fun. And, and, and you're right. Like hosting is a blast, like getting to throw a party, uh, for a bunch of people is, is so much fun. And I think is a, 
you know, as a couple of extroverts, there's, there's something like really exciting about like, let's get up and get people fired up about a thing. Uh, it's, it's really, really great. But um, I would imagine not even knowing you too well outside of your, of your professional career, I would imagine that we are both introverted extroverts. Yeah. I think to a certain extent. Absolutely. When I'm home, I'm very quiet. Mm. You know, I'm not saying this is some kind of a persona that I'm putting on, but it's just yeah. one side of who I am. Yes. And when I'm home doing my thing, I'm really chill. Yeah. I'm, uh, I am too. I turn on without a doubt when I get in front of this little thing or in front of this little thing, then, uh, and, or when I go out into the world, like I'm like Norm at cheers at our local Starbucks, but like, but in the house, I'm very like, sh- like, uh, we lately got an Oculus and like, I love disappearing into the, into the VR and like, love it. you know, it's, I had a, I had a PSVR and I gifted it to my nephews last Christmas. Oh, I'm not man. sure if it's on Oculus, but you got to try firewall zero hour. If it is, Oh, it's Ooh. incredible. It's absolutely the number one VR experience I've ever, ever experienced. Amazing. Uh, unreal. Amazing. All right. I'll see if it's there. I don't think it is. I think it's still just on PSVR. And um, because I I definitely want to get into a a good first person shooter for for uh, because that's the whole point. Right. Like that's really what what the VR really is, is just being able to play Call of Duty in VR is really exciting. Like I I love squadrons in VR, which is uh, just flying out of a ship into into Star Wars outer space is it was uh, moving. It was something else. Anyway, uh, that's somebody else's creation. Hell, uh, how, did, how did you find yourself? Because um, you you teach and coach. How did you uh, make that transition or add that into your portfolio of offerings? What, um, what, what led you into that space? I only decided to do it because my mentors were so dang generous to me. Huh. Really? Like, I remember thinking back on it, like, why in the world are they inviting me to this stuff? Like, I'm kind of a nobody. These guys have, have big agents and big bookings and big resumes. I don't even know why I was there. Uh-huh. They were so generous. And I look back on that and I just want to pay it forward a little bit. Hmm. You know, it's like, wow, that's just kind of what we do in this industry. We pay it forward. Yeah. And that's what the great ones do, at least. I I, I was given that terrific example earlier in my career yeah. of how to pay it forward generously. Um, so a good friend of mine and, and, and another voice actor, Rick Party, has an excellent quote. He says, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Hmm. I had never heard that before I heard Rick say it. He may have coined it. It's so money. It's like when the student is hungry, the teacher will appear. Yeah. And I think my mentors just saw that I was hungry. So when I see folks are hungry nowadays, but they don't really know where to go next, but they're hungry. And I want to step into that mentor role for them. Yeah. I can't offer them representation. I, I don't produce demos. I'm not going to produce your demo. I have no job to offer you. Yeah. That's the main point. I have no gig to offer you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not, there's not a, uh, nothing you can gain other than mentorship and some, Hey, these are some avenues to go. Yeah. I just think paying it forward is really important in this life. It's a very short life. Yes. It's yeah. not about money. It's not about credits. Yeah. It's only about the people at that's the right. end of the day. It's only about the people. Yeah. And that's why I love to be as a mentor as much as possible. Now I'll roll it back even further. My choir teacher in those high school years was my number one scholastic mentor. And we kind of had a rough childhood and it was very chaotic. Yeah. And all of a sudden I had somebody that I considered a mentor. Yeah. Not saying he stepped into any kind of father role or nothing like that. I'm just saying somebody that I could look up to personally and professionally. That was an example of kind of how to be a man in a giving, in a giving way. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. That's so true. Like this, there is that. There's a there's a call to to invest in our contemporaries and the future that's beyond our presence in it, right? Like, like the uh, part part of part of teaching for me has always felt like I, I say, and I know it's to a certain extent it's not true, but I still feel it internally. I didn't. I didn't pay for this experience of learning what I've learned in this job. These are things that came to me through a series of auditions and or bookings and or wins and or failures. And these are the things that have worked for me and there's nothing proprietary about it. And, um, 
and and I I love this work. And if you love it, then let's nerd out about it in a way. It's like Ryan the Last Dragon, like the Dragon Nerds thing. It's like I I feel that very much about this about all aspects of what we do. And for if someone feels the same way about it, I want to. I, I want to high five them and be like, isn't this awesome? And, Oh, have you tried this? And have you like the way, um, you know, like, like gymnasts will try to talk about how they do like, I don't know why gymnasts, but you know, or like crafts people it's cause we're a guild. You know what I mean? We're like, we're a bunch of crafts people who work with our instrument and then finding, finding best practices is really exciting to share. And when you see someone get it, it's like, right. You know? And, um, you know, is is that is that what led you to to uh to the v, the voiceover pros uh space as well in clubhouse or how did how did that aspect of what you do come about with like an emerging uh, technology or what like, i'm so glad you mentioned uh, the failures primarily the failures yes like that's number one yeah and they they hurt they sting they stay with you don't they, they really you kind of forget about the bookings after a while but the failures oh you don't forget about those no but that's no, really what molds you. That's if you can right. start eating those failures for breakfast and seeking out the next one, all right, then you have some, then you have a chance, then you have some potential. That's so great. So when I discovered Clubhouse, I kind of was late to the party because I think it came out a year ago. Okay. I think I jumped on in January or so. I instantly knew it was gold. Instantly. There's one of these things, and only because I was, I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase it, gold for my specific skill set. Uh, Someone who is an audio professional, yeah, but also yeah. a host. Yes, It's really the marriage of my two loves. Yeah, we're talking yeah. about voiceover. We're talking about craft. We're talking about performing arts, but it's a hosting opportunity. Yeah, It's what I love to do. Yeah, I'm not doing it to try to make money. I'm doing it because I love doing it. Yeah, You know, if you're doing it to make money, you're going to burn out. Any, you're going to have burnout no matter what you're doing. Yes. Clubhouse burnout, VO burnout. Anything you get involved in, yes. you're going to face some degree of burnout. Yeah. I mean, you were yeah. talking about video games the other day. How often do you get a new game? And all you can do is think of that game. You just can't get, you can't wait to get home to play it. Right. Two or three months later, it's on the shelf. You never even put it in for the rest of your life. It's There's exactly burnout right. in everything. Yeah. So if you're not, if you're not in it for the passion, you, you will absolutely face that burnout. Yes. For me, when I, when I realized what Clubhouse was and I was, because it's invite only, which is a little, I don't know what that is, but that, that'll change. Yeah. But when I was gifted an invite and I kind of just started messing around, I was like, oh, oh, this is, this is it. This is what I'm going to be putting my time into for the foreseeable future. Wow. Because I miss hosting, Kiff. Yeah. I'm so blessed to be a full-time voice actor. I've got a great home studio that I work out of and I love it, but I miss hosting. Yeah. I don't yeah. miss living out of a suitcase. No. Nope. And I don't miss missing voiceover opportunities because I'm on the road living right. out of a suitcase. Right. I don't miss any of that, but I do miss hosting. And I always loved radio. I, I, I'm a really freakish individual. I'll get in the car and I'll put on talk radio. I'm a musician. I'm a singer and a pianist. I don't even listen to music. I listen to talk radio, period. I'm a freak. All right. That's who we are. <laughs> that, you know, you don't have to be that way to be successful. I'm just saying that's who I am. Right. I listen to, I listen to sports talk radio and I listen to, you know, just general, you know, AFI six, you know, six forty KFI, that kind of talk radio. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So even at home, I'll be doing the dishes and I'll have literally, I'll have talk radio on. It's just, I love hosting and I love talk. Yeah. So for me, clubhouse is just a marriage of those two things. And the relationships that it affords is mm -hmm. unreal. I've connected with so many individuals across the world who are passionate and hungry and share similar interests. And it's absolutely motivating for me to see their motivation and dedication. Amazing. Oh, that's so, dude, that's beautiful. Tell, well, for, for those of us who are either uh, haven't been gifted an invite, A, or B, uh, on an Android platform exclusively, uh, what would tell me a little bit about what the experience of of uh as a user the the voiceover pros uh, club is and and what that uh feels like and what kind of what the uh, just so uh, you know i i have a clear idea when i walk into the room well if you're interested in getting an invite you can check out my ebay account i'm kidding obviously <laughs> But they are selling invites on eBay and Reddit, just so you know. Yes. Do, do not be scammed. Yes. You, know, you should never have to pay for one, but they literally are going, which is hilarious. Wow. Um, the voiceover pros concept is, in the description, literally the first paragraph is, it's where professional and aspiring voice actors come together. Mm -hmm. I, that's literally the first thing I wrote in the club description. It's not a hierarchy 
of here we are, the yeah. professionals, and there you are, the minions, the commoners, everyone else. Right. Look at us, praise us, shower us with gifts. That's <laughs> not what this is. There's enough of that already. Yes, there is. You know, you can't even shake hands with people because yeah. there's that separation. Like, oh, no, sorry. It's the haves and have nots. Right. I don't like that. That ain't my vibe. Agreed. I like everyone being in the same party together, regardless of who you are. Yes. I, I always mention on our shows, no self-promotion. I don't care who you are. If you self-promote, I already know who you are. Feel me? <laughs> I already know who you are. And I don't like that. Yes. I don't like self-promotion. So it's where everybody comes together. Yeah. Whether you're a seasoned pro who's doing this full time or whether you just someone told you you have a good voice and you just are interested in what the craft is. Yeah. Well, right on. Here's a watering hole that we can all gather at. So generally we'll have two different types of shows, either a, it'll be an open panel with a, with a generally large group of panelists, anywhere from three to 15. Wow. Those wow. folks are generally professionals. Uh -huh. We'll do a small interview with everyone on stage first, and then we'll open it up to audience Q and a. So that's an opportunity for folks who are interested in getting involved. Otherwise aspiring talent. Uh, they can ask questions directly to folks who are literally working in the industry. It's a way for them to put a name to a face yeah. and to actually meet somebody. And the other style we'll do is one-on-one -on -one interviews. Why would it, essentially what we're doing here? Okay, I would bring you on the show, Kiff. I'd interview you for a couple moments, talk about your life and career, and then again we'd open it up to audience Q and A. That's the really cool thing about the Clubhouse platform, is that it's like a live radio show where you have folks calling in, yeah. but you don't actually have to pick up the phone and call. You just raise your hand in the app. It's like, quote unquote, raise your hand. So it's a very seamless transition of bringing folks up, getting the question in, and you can lower them back to the, to the audience once they're done asking a question. It's literally a live radio show. Wow. And for a lover of talk radio, it's exactly what I've always wanted. Yeah. That's fantastic. Oh man. All right. You're right. I need to get a burner phone. Or, or uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll get something uh, like knowing that you can use an old iPad touch is uh, is great. Uh, I can I can make that happen. Um, oh, fantastic! What 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 are some of the things that? How has how has that experience, and the experience of 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 teaching and giving back? How has that changed you as a performer? And, and as, uh, and, you know, more so as a, as a person, like how has, how have, have those opportunities, uh, both given to you and what, what are some of the most, uh, profound or things that resonated that still resonate with you that you've learned through that experience? You know, being a great voice actor has a lot to do with listening. Mm. Such an important, we, we think we got to get up there and talk. Yeah. And yes. Essentially that's what we're doing. But it's like in music, the silence is what makes it or the moments in between. Listening is really vital in voice acting. Yeah. And the more I coach, the more I listen because I'm not actually the one doing the read. Yeah. I'm the one analyzing the read and commenting and critiquing the read. Yeah. I become a better voice actor each time I do a coaching session or a workout group hmm. that, I, that I'm leading. Obviously, the same goes to when I'm participating in a workout group. Yeah. But when I'm coaching, I become a better voice actor every single time because I'm listening, yeah. I'm taking a different role. I'm observing what's being done and considering how it fits into the given script. Yeah, It's all about listening. I think the more and more I've coached, the more and more that has come to the forefront for me, mm -hmm. how vital listening is. Yeah. I think a lot of the best teachers you'll find, maybe they don't even need to say that much. It's not, it's not a monologue, it's coaching, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, some people hate line reads. I guess that's kind of the idea. It's like, you're not trying to tell someone how to do it. You're trying to lead them to self-discovery yes. of how to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Totally. I, I feel like that's, I, that's my goal as a coach is that you never need another coach. That you, you know, my goal for you as a coach is to recognize the, you know, I mean, improv, let you recognize patterns and that you recognize the patterns in your own work and that you recognize the pattern of the script and that you recognize the pattern of when you are interesting or dynamic or just, just observing those patterns and then, and then learning how to replicate them. And, um, the, the last series of the last series of things that I taught were, were based on nurturing yourself coach and nurturing that voice inside that that knows what the right thing is but people will reach out because they feel they need to to do something and sometimes doing something is important to flip the script a little bit but also i think you're 100% right and that you know 
what you really need to do as a as as a performer as, as who talks for a living is to shut up and listen and, you know what i mean and listen to uh, listen to what the script is telling you listen to what you know uh what your what your intuition is telling you um i think that's really uh undervalued um and you know uh i i've never been one to mark up a script and i i it, that's just not been my journey um uh, or the thing that's really resonated with me but i think that that's you know um I think there's there's certainly value for folks who have found ways through that but um, you know, it's so funny. I used to mark up my scripts a lot and I was taking some classes with Art Butler at Voice Tracks West. Yeah. I go in the booth one time and he asks, uh, maybe it was for a copy of the script. I'm trying to think why I handed him the script that I had marked up. For some reason I did. Yeah. And he looks at it and I'm in the booth and he's like, Danny, don't do this. He's like, this is the difference between like college and the pros. He's like, I can hear you doing these markups. Essentially what he's saying is you're too tied to these markups mm. and there's a, there's a place for it when you're first starting out. Yes. I'm not saying marking up a script is a bad idea. Yes. I'm just piggybacking on what you said, Kiff, is at some point you just have to know what to, you, you sense it. You don't need to follow a markup. That's so right. from that point on, I stopped marking up my scripts as well and just kind of <laughs> trusted my use the force at the death yeah. star. Right. Yeah, totally. And sometimes your markup is going to lock you into a specific choice that for your B take might be completely limiting it's hard to go against the markup it really is i mean it's hard to go against what's on the written page when they've got copy underlined and highlighted and and italicized and it's like you know everyone's gonna read to you that way and if that's what you want great but like direct me in the booth not in the audition give me the chance to show you who i am as an artist rather than who i am as a as a as a trained seal you know what i mean let me i'll I, you know, um, I'm, I'm happy to give you alternates, but like, uh, I don't know that's, and that, that kind of attitude about this sort of combative attitude about copy, uh, has come with just time and, and more importantly, come with confidence, right? Like the, the sense of, I, I, I get what you're asking me to do, but let me show you what else could be done. Or maybe the emotional life that I'm bringing to it is vastly different from what you're telling me needs to be bolded. Maybe it's not about time. It's about memory, you know? Um, anyway. And that time can't be understated. It's that whole 10,000 hours concept. Yeah, right. It takes right. a very, very long time to be able to just know this is the read. This is it. This is the one right here. Or this is the vibe. Yeah. I think I remember hearing a Don LaFontaine interview where he said, there's only one way to do the read that I just did. How I did it. That's the only way to do it. He was a master. Yeah. And that didn't happen overnight. That didn't happen when... He had taken a class for three weeks and gotten a demo produced. And here he is saying that <laughs> this was just so after true. decades and decades and decades where That's he right. knew there's only one way to do that. Reed, the way I just did it. Yep, exactly. Oh, that's so fantastic. Well, dude, our, our time is coming to an end. Tell me how people can find you and find uh, and find the voiceover pros clubhouse uh, uh, group and um, and uh, can like study with you, et cetera. Right on. And again, thank you so much for your time, Kev. Oh, You're an awesome host. And it's thank just been a, a blast to chat with you. You too, man. This has been amazing. So you can hit me up on my website, dannyburnside.com. I also use the handle voiceover host on Clubhouse. You can also go to voiceoverhost.com. It's going to lead you to the same place, but dannyburnside.com. Uh, if you're interested in coaching or pro workout groups, hit me up there. If you're on Clubhouse, either voiceover pros, which is the official club, or the handle voiceover host you can also just search danny burnside but uh hit me up not selling any products but selling a lot of love and some uh guidance that can steer you down the right route dude that's so great it's been such a pleasure to talk to you uh and uh you know it's what i love about this work like the people that that gravitate towards it uh have that same it's a, you know, it's a specific frequency of gravitational force that draws us to this work and to each other. And, uh, dude, it's a, it's a pleasure knowing you and I'm really grateful for this time. And, uh, uh, so, so thank you so much for sharing your journey and your advice and, uh, and all that stuff. And I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks, but I look forward to continuing the friendship as well. Thanks, Amen. Kiff. You're you right, man. Thanks so much. Thank you, Danny. And thank you, all of you listening. Uh, this has been another episode of All Over VoiceOver. There'll be more coming soon. Uh, you know, peace. 
This has been All Over VoiceOver with Kiff VH. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and give us a positive rating. It truly helps. Follow me on Twitter at Kiff VH or on Instagram at Kiff VH or on Vero at Kiff VH. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you soon. Claim victory and depart the field. Werewolf? Yeah.